let me just thank all of you for all that you do. And, and let me start out by saying that when I'm on the campaign trail, um, I often say that I have a passion and a talent. The passion is public education. And I don't believe there's any job we have that's more important than preparing our children to be the workers, the leaders, and the innovators of future generations. My talent's finance. And like many of you in this room, I'm one of those people that can look at numbers and tell you if they add up and make sense. And I sometimes would drive the people in my district nuts. But, um, you know, I, I describe myself as a fiscal conservative. You know, I believe that we have to manage our money well if we're going to be able to sustain the programs we value. And so being a good fiscal steward of the district's budget goes hand in hand with being able to provide a strong academic program. Today I want to talk to you about three issues, issues capital appreciation and bonds, the 2014 statewide school facilities bond, and bond oversight. And then I'm happy to, to spend as much time as you want answering any questions that you have. Let me start by saying that my introduction to school facilities began long before Prop 39. My children's elementary school had no multi-use room. They ate their lunches in the classroom every day um, and before being dismissed to the playground where they could release their energy. When the PTA sponsored assemblies, it was very expensive. We either had to pay for multiple shows that we could have in, a, in an empty classroom um, or students had to carry their chairs out to the blacktop to uh, participate in the assembly. Their elementary school was recognized as the National Blue Ribbon School the very first year of the program. And that first year was being showcased by the Clinton administration and they sent representatives from the Federal Department of Education to present the plaques to every school that received this recognition. <coughs> My kids' elementary school was the only school in the entire U.S. Not, did not have a place for the students to go. And while my children's school did not have a multi-use room, other schools in the district had situations that were even worse. Now, about half of our elementary schools had leaky roofs. And when it rained, custodians brought in 32-gallon trash cans to, into the classrooms to catch the water. And they put sheets of plastic over the computers to protect them. So how did our schools get in this condition? Well, most of you know it was not the result of any one event or decision. It was a result of a series of events. When the schools were built, our community was a rural community. Lots of peach orchards and pear orchards. And the schools were designed to be constructed at minimal cost. Um, the thought of how do you um, how do you take into consideration the life cycle of the building and, and have minimum maintenance really wasn't considered. They were, I don't want to say they were constructed on the cheap, because they've actually done fairly well, but, but they weren't constructed to the standards most schools are constructed today. Then Proposition 13 passed and eliminated the ability of local agencies, including school districts, to issue general obligation bonds. So now if your schools needed um, uh, modernization or you needed to add classrooms to alleviate overcrowding, school districts had no ability to do this. So this, um, you know, again, resulted in schools that were slowly deteriorating. Six years later, in 1984, the voters passed Prop 46, allowing school districts to issue general obligation bonds, but required a two-thirds voter approval. So in 1986, uh, uh, also in Two years later, in 1986, the legislature passed AB 2926, allowing school districts to levy developer fees based on new development. So the school districts now had two, two tools, a two-thirds obligation bond and developer fees. Neither was actually adequate to raise the funds that schools needed to meet their backlog of, of construction projects. So in our districts, it took us three times to pass a school bond. The first time we received 61% of the vote. The second time, and some of the, uh, the, the bond consultants now, our campaign consultants talk about our district, we lost by four yes votes or two no votes, you know, since it's a two-thirds election. So if anyone wants to know whether or not every vote counts, believe me, every vote does count. Okay. And then we came back a third time, and we finally passed with just over 70% of the vote. The bond was not nearly large enough to meet all of our facility needs, but it was a start and it really it made a difference. So 
the reason I tell this story is because it's not just about my district, it's about school facilities throughout the state. When we fail to make an adequate investment in our facilities, um, the taxpayers pay much more in the long run to fix and maintain our buildings over time. If one doesn't repair or replace a leaky roof, as happened in our school district, the water leaks down into the framing of the building, you have dry rot, and then the cost to modernize real place is much more expensive. And that's frankly why Prop 39 has been so important to our schools. By lowering the voting threshold to 55%, significantly more school districts have been able to pass bonds. The local bonds combined with developer fees and statewide bonds have resulted in $100 billion in improvements to our schools in the last about 12 or 14 years. One third of that money has come from statewide bonds and two thirds has come from local bonds and developer fees. Prop 39 meant that districts finally had money to address years of neglect. But as you know, Prop 39 came with conditions. The debt to assess property value in the school district could not exceed two and a half percent of assessed value for unified districts. And the reasonable expectation that the tax rate would not exceed $60 per $100,000 of taxable assessed value was required as we went out and sold these bonds. So while the State Board of Education can waive the two and a half percent debt to AV ratio, a district must pass a two thirds uh, prop 39 bond to get that waiver, but the district cannot exceed the $60 per $100,000 of assessed value rate. So these conditions didn't significantly impact financing of school bonds for a long time. Why? Because so many districts like mine were practically locked out of the bond market. We could, they couldn't get reached that two-thirds capacity to sell bonds. So they were starting at the beginning. And two, you know, over this early 2000s, we had the housing bubble. So assessed values just kept going up and up and up. And that meant your two and a half percent or your sixty dollars, you know, you kept that kind of going up and up in terms of what you can get, what you could, um, uh, where you could be as you were um, selling these bonds. But then in 2006, when the housing bubble caught and assessed values began to fall, fall dramatically, and let's face it, in some communities that had the greatest growth, right, the property values fell the most. All of a sudden, districts found themselves in a conundrum. Many of them had the bond, the authority to go out and sell bonds, but all of a sudden, their bond plan changed because they didn't have the capacity. So that set the stage for the expanded use, and I will also say the abuse of capital appreciation laws. Most of you know about the Poway story, which has been the poster child. And I'm not using Poway to actually point the finger, and I know Poway's probably very tired of hearing this, because there are districts that um, have sold bonds that I would call much more egregious. But Poway had $100 million in remaining bond authorization and projects that needed to be completed. And no one can question the need of these projects or the value of the projects to the community or the school district itself. But the problem Poway faced was that it had an implied and assessed valuation and it was pushing up against the Prop 39 AV limits. So Poway sold capital appreciation bonds. The bonds were sold under the government code, which allows a repayment term of 40 years, not under the education code, which limits the repayment period to 25 years. The bonds were structured so that no debt service was paid the first 20 years. Debt, services, debt service payments begin in year 29 with interest deferred until the end of the repayment period. This results in total debt service of $1 billion for payment of approximately $100 million in principal, a debt service to principal ratio of 10 to 1. Now, put this in perspective, if Poway had the ability to sell a 25-year current interest bond, the debt service would have been less than $200 million. Stated another way, if Poway had sold a 25-year current interest bond with voters paying a total of a billion dollars in debt service, the total debt service that will be paid over the 40-year period, it would have received $600 million in net proceeds for facility projects instead of $100 million.